correct something that I said just a minute ago. I mentioned the, the, the question was what the function of this inferior olivary nucleus was, and I gave you sound uh, pathway, and that it was incorrect. It's actually a cerebellar role, which we'll talk about the cerebellum in just a minute. I was mixing it up with the uh, olivary complex, the superior olivary complex in the ponds. Uh, okay, any other questions before I move on to the cerebellum, and then we'll tie that in with all of our motor regions. There's actually more than one thing that does motor, and we got to understand how those connect. Okay, so let's talk about the cerebellum. It's the second largest part of the brain. Uh, now, we have gyri and sulci as a general term for the bumps and invaginations on the surface of the brain itself. In the cerebellum, we actually used to think that there was a historical time period where we thought all, all thought and reason came from the cerebellum. That turned out to be incorrect. But when we do a cross section of the cerebellum, we see this thing that we've called the tree of life, the arbor vitae. So the white matter in the cerebellum is called the arbor vitae. And now instead of calling them gyri and sulci, we're actually going to call them folia, like foliage. It's like leaves of a tree. So all of our little miniature gyri on the cerebellum are folia now. This is a mid-sagittal section. Now, unlike the cerebrum, which has very little connection between right and left hemisphere, the right and left hemisphere of the cerebellum is connected via the vermis. So when we cut that vermis, that's when we see our tree of life, our arbor vitae, uh, and again, the folia are all of our, what we, we would otherwise call gyri here. Now your cerebellum is going to fine tune skeletal muscle movement. This is gonna do very, very complex movement. Now, when I reorganized this information, one thing that I did was I put the, I, we're gonna talk about the cerebellum and then I'm gonna talk about other parts of the brain that also do motor. We've already seen one part of the brain that does motor function. We saw our precentral gyrus, right? Which has our primary motor cortex on it and that executes a movement. So we're going to have to say, okay, this part, this motor thing does this, this motor thing does this, this motor thing does this. How are they different from each other and how do they interact with each other? And that's what I've pieced together across these two chapters to make this more solid for you. So the cere cerebellum is fine tuning movement. What we find is that we also have a uh, memory we have some of our muscle memory here. You've heard the phrase muscle memory before, right? So if you learn to play the piano as a kid and maybe you haven't practiced for a couple of years, but you can still sit down and at least pick out something, right? Maybe not as well as you used to. That's probably from your cerebellum. This is really, really complex and fine tuned things. So your premotor cortex is just initiating the thing, right? But your cerebellum is fine tuning the thing. So my example for this, I always have a story to connect these things and anchor them. My story is um, predatory animals are going to have a larger cerebellum than prey animals. And the reason is that they're going to need to do some very complex things to catch animals. So let's say you're a hawk and you're flying up in the air and you need to keep catch that rabbit on the ground. That rabbit has evolved to like zigzag around, right? Uh, it's not going in a straight line. So as a hawk, you've got to coordinate flying and catching that rabbit. And you've got to aim for where that rabbit is going to be, not where it is right now, like the hardest game of putt-putt of your life, right? It's complex. So your cerebellum is the thing that's enabling you to do that, to do something very advanced. So your cerebellum, therefore, is going to be in communication with your primary motor cortex, right? It will inform your primary motor cortex, and then your primary motor cortex will decide what you do. Absolutely. Uh, so your cerebellum is in communication with your primary motor cortex, and then your motor cortex sends out the actual signal to do that thing. So again, another slide from the other chapter that I pulled forward is that it's sending error correcting signals. So that, okay, maybe you missed the rabbit the first time, but now you can do something a little bit more advanced. You learned from that and you can fix it and catch the rabbit the next time. So you will have that go through that thalamus. Again, the thalamus is a relay station. So you will have that connection from cerebellum. 
you'll have a synapse in the thalamus and that'll go to your primary motor cortex. Any questions about just the cerebellum? So we had those olives that also were part of this pathway. Um, we have a relay station in the thalamus for this, so go back and connect this idea to previous ideas that we have covered so far. There's one more motor area. Other motor features, which your textbook has referred to as the cerebral nuclei, which is a sort of modern terminology that is accurate. These are nuclei within this, the cerebrum because they're collections of cell bodies within the central nervous system. That terminology makes sense. But everybody you interact with who's five years older than you or was doing this five years ago is going to refer to those as the basal ganglia. How did we define ganglia? Not axons, cell bodies where? In the peripheral nervous system. So it's not technically correct to call these ganglia because they're CNS structures. So that's why we felt the need to rename them, but everybody's going to call them basal ganglia. And that's just the way it is. Your patho textbook is going to refer to them as basal ganglia. Yeah. If you really wanted to, yeah. It's still, it's, no matter what you do, it's going to be problematic. So, yeah. It's all problematic for days. Okay, these are really, really important to your long-term clinical understanding of a variety of conditions, including but not limited to Parkinson's disease. It's also going to help you understand, um, let's see, Huntington's disease. It's going to help you understand side effects of certain uh, drugs that block dopamine. This is all really, really clinically important. This is long-term information. Know it. Period. This is the best image for the cerebral nuclei or basal ganglia. You can see right over here is the, make sure I say this right, caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus. This over here is the thalamus. We're not worrying about them right now. We're just worrying about caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus. Now, your basal ganglia have a series of pathways that you're not responsible for learning right now, but which we will refer to in general terms later. These are going to be excited at both an excitatory pathway and an inhibitory pathway. You're going to have two types of dopamine receptors that when activated make you move more or make you move less. What this gets you is the correct amount of movement, not too much or not too little, which means you're not moving when you don't want to be moving and you can initiate movement when you want to move, which is much more difficult than you would imagine for your brain to control. That's why you have these specific pathways for it. So when you have a condition related to the basal ganglia, such as Parkinson's disease, you have movement when you don't want to be moving, tremors, and you have difficulty initiating movements you want to make. Right. Yeah. So she's missing at that point those excitatory pathways or disinhibiting the other ones. Absolutely. So yeah, you lose your intention. Uh, and part of Parkinson's is also like mask like facial expression. So you do lose some of the motor to your face very early, even as you have the tremor. It can be both at the same time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, okay, we understand the pathway for it. We understand that the dopamine ceases to be produced from the substantia nigra in the midbrain. So that substantia nigra projects to these basal ganglia and releases dopamine here, right? Um, as far as what causes that substantia nigra to stop producing dopamine, that part's poorly understood. Yeah. Where do we use dopamine for So L-dopa is the treatment for Parkinson's, for example. What we're going to see, you may have noticed I haven't taught you individual neurotransmitters. I haven't sat here and said dopamine does this, serotonin does this. Um, part of that is more and more what we've discovered is that it's not the substance. At the end of the day, it's just is it excitatory or is it inhibitory? What we've discovered, discovered is there are 19 receptor subtypes just for serotonin. 
So the function of serotonin is based on what part of the brain is it projecting to and what is it doing when it gets there. So I can't actually just sit here and say serotonin is your happiness neurotransmitter. That actually is not accurate. It is also your neurotransmitter for anxiety and anger and sleep and wake and hallucinating and all kinds of things. Uh, satiety, like it's all over the place. So I, that's, I don't just sit here and tell you about neurotransmitters for that reason. Uh, but dopamine is part of your rewards pathway, your movement pathway, and your learning pathway. Yeah, so it does a lot of different things. So dopamine clinically will worry about it in terms of the, the addiction pathway. That's worth knowing. But mainly we're going to focus on this movement pathway for it. You guys have heard that joke, the only things I've ever enjoyed are dopamine and serotonin. That's totally inaccurate. <laughs> Because even that dopamine rewards pathway ultimately acts on GABA instead, which is your main inhibitory neurotransmitter. That's all. Okay, do you feel like you understand the cerebral nuclei, aka basal ganglia? Okay, so think of these three motor areas. Your basal ganglia are going to interact with your cerebellum, are going to interact with your primary motor cortex, they will, they're will they all in communication with each other. And ultimately that allows, do I have a thing? There we go. So these are all connecting with each other. And the, of course, your motor association area is also connecting to your primary motor cortex. And then your primary motor cortex fires the impulse and decides what to do. So that's actually the last stop before you do a movement. Does that make sense? So you need all three functioning. Uh, it's going to be both. Both of these are going to inform that primary motor cortex. It's not necessarily one or the other. I can also give you clinical signs for something called cerebellar ataxia. So think about when you're drunk. Alcohol is a CNS depressant. One thing it suppresses is the cerebellum. And then you get that cerebellar ataxic gait. So that's what stumbling around like a drunk person is going to look a lot like cerebellar ataxia. So that also gives you an idea of what the cerebellum is doing. Right? Good stuff, right? I'm getting kind of close. Did I even do the limbic system last time? I think I did the limbic system same day. Uh, questions before we move on to some more cool things that the brain does. Yeah. So is it because the systems of brain? This one? The, yeah. The cerebral nuclei and the primary motor cortex both send? Ultimately, the thing that sends the motor impulse down to your body is the primary motor cortex. Okay. And again, we will talk about that pathway. That pathway is the corticospinal tract. And we will define and, and map that entire tract. Yep. Let me see how I organize this stuff real quick. Okay. That uh, the tracks, the pathways are going to take some time. So even though we're getting really close, we'll take some time around those pathways. Let's talk about the limbic system. I literally just reviewed this in patho the other day uh, because nobody could remember it from AMP1. So um, you absolutely, absolutely need to understand the structures of the limbic system, or at least what's called the limbic system. This is, like, again, a little simplistic. We don't quite teach it this way at the med school level anymore, but we're going to roll with it. Really what you're looking at is several structures that are interconnected with each other that aid in emotional decision making. Now, I used to teach the limbic system right at the end of uh, class, or right at the end of lecture, week eight, right after your exam. And usually right after week eight, right after the exam, somebody comes in with like a big thing of donuts or some ice cream, something that lets me tell the story about how we make emotional decisions in a very friendly way. So we'll pretend that we've got a big pile of donuts right in front of us right now. So here are the regions. Your hypothalamus, you already know that has a role in homeostasis. 
Your hippocampus, we have not addressed this yet. Your hippocampus is a deep structure within the temporal lobe. Your amygdala is a little body right on the end of that hippocampus. And your cingulate cortex, or cingulate gyrus rather, this is gonna be immediately superficial to that corpus callosum. So again, we'll use that corpus callosum as our guidepost for finding other structures. And of course, your cerebrum is gonna come into play as well. So these structures are all interconnected. So here's the story. Your hypothalamus, okay, it's test day. You just like bombed exam three, whatever. You're in a bad mood. Your blood sugar is low. Your cerebrum knows that you're feeling bad and you're in a bad mood. Your hypothalamus detects your internal state of your body, including that information from your cerebrum about being in a bad mood, but also it's detecting your blood sugar level is low. Now your hypothalamus is connected to your hippocampus via your fornix. What your hippocampus does is it's a filing system for memories. What we mentioned before about our association areas is your association areas actually hold your memories. So your hippocampus isn't holding your memories. If we remove the hippocampus, your memories aren't gone. They just can't be attached to each other correctly, right? So you'll have like your memory of donuts and the smell of donuts and the sensation of eating donuts, the flavor of donuts, the emotional association with donuts, right? That's gonna be from your hippocampus. That's going to retrieve those memories correctly. And you're just gonna get that donut information. You're not gonna get that ice cream information or like frog information because your hippocampus activated the correct neurons in the correct part of your cerebrum. Cool, right? Okay, so now um, you know your internal state. Your internal state was sent to your memory center and your memory center actually thought to you, what did I do last time I felt like this? right? To really seriously anthropomorphize it, you're going through memories of feeling how you felt like that before. Your amygdala is closely associated with your hippocampus. This is emotional processing. This is where you get your emotions from. So of course, your emotions and memories are very tied into each other, right? I felt like this before. I feel really sad. I'm really miserable. My blood sugar is low. Everything sucks. I'm going to, and then you're gonna to have to make a decision. We'll send this information up to the cingulate gyrus. And this one decides, hey, I remember that time mom took us to get donuts after we had a really bad day and we felt better. That gets sent to the cingulate gyrus, which decides I'm gonna go get donuts. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking of the hippocampus. Yes, it's going to inhibit forming new memories. Absolutely. Um, with people like, his name is Henry Malayson, I think. I learned him as patient HM because he was still alive when I was undergrad. They did a bilateral uh, temporal, uh, temporal lo lobe removal, basically. They removed part of his temporal lobes that has the hippocampus in it. He was unable to make new memories. He remembered all of his life before he had those parts of his brain removed. Um, but he would even have a hard time finishing a sentence. Like by the time he was done on his, with a sentence, it was no longer the same sentence he started with at that point. So he could recognize his wife, who ultimately divorced him, but he didn't know. Um, he would turn around and then she was like, oh, you're here, I'm so glad, I'm so happy to see you. And then he could turn around and he could turn back to her and go, you're here, I'm so glad, I'm so happy to see you. Yeah, right, you, you age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they took that from patient HM. Uh, so yes, that's the hippocampus, and yes, it's anterograde memory. Yeah, John. Uh, intractable epilepsy. Yeah, completely untreated or untreatable epilepsy of the temporal lobes bilaterally. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, frontal lobotomies are weird. So we, aside from the frontal lobe being motor, we also sort of assume it's the seat of personality and morality and higher order thinking. Um, I take a slight bit of issue with that, but if there is some historical precedence for it. Yeah, you'll mess up some motor regions if you're just messing around in that frontal lobe. But yeah, when we say frontal lobotomy, we do mean frontal lobe lobotomy. Yep. Arguably, your textbook's going to put it in there. Uh, your olfactory circuitry does go right next to your hippocampus, which is why some people will say, you know, you have really, really strong memories associated with smell. Or maybe while you're studying, you should smell some kind of scent and then also have that scent while you're taking the exam, things like that. Um, in terms of like, have, and yeah, you can have emotions in response to smells, sure, why not? But in terms of understanding the, lingu uh, the limbic system, that's not my highest priority. Yep. None. Um, no, learning styles don't actually exist. Uh, there's a lot of, and as an educator who sits in on a lot of education seminars and has to listen to people talking about learning styles all the time, it's like me and Seth just roll our eyes every time we hear it. Now, here's how I, well, how I integrate that, though. Um, and the reason that, like, I have you draw a lot of pictures and make things out of clay, it's what's really important to learning at the end of the day is repetition. So the way I think of it is why not put that memory into as many parts of your brain as you can, right? Why not give it a motor component? Why not give it a sensory component? Why not give it a visual component while you're repeating it to yourself? Because you have to repeat it to yourself anyway, you might as well be storing it in as many parts of your brain as you can and making that repetition fun. So yes, you should listen to it. You should see it. You should touch it. You should do it. You should draw it. You should make a play out of it. Do an interpretive dance about it, right? It'll be repetition, and it'll help it get into your brain without getting boring. And so, yeah, you can still use it. It's it's there's no evidence whatsoever for it, though. Not neurologically speaking. Um, let me tell you one different story of the limbic system that's actually worked better, but is also potentially traumatizing. Okay. Um, and what I mean by that is, this is also how trauma works. When somebody was traumatized as a child, let's say they grew up in an explosive, unstable environment, abusive parents, alcoholic parents, something like that, right? So as a child, you build up these patterns in your limbic system and you build up decision-making system, uh, yeah, through your limbic system, right? As a child in an abusive setting, you're going to develop specific tendencies that are not going to work as well when you get out of that place, right? So somebody in an abusive scenario may learn to hide. They may learn to be on guard all of the time. They may learn um, to explode back at a certain stage, right? They may develop some very unstable patterns. And it makes sense for that child in that situation to hide or always be on guard. If you're around abusive parents and you're constantly tuned in to, is something gonna explode, is something bad gonna happen? That is adaptive for that situation. But when you grow up and get out of that situation, you still have that circuitry. You still have those pathways, right? So then as an adult, if you're constantly on guard, you're constantly in fight or flight, it's gonna be very stressful, it's gonna be very anxious, it's gonna not be adaptive, but you're gonna have a hard time forming relationships if your systems are really, really um, malformed, maladaptive. Uh, so you had a question, then you have a question. Absolutely. Yeah, so you can see this play out in your personal life. You can see it play out in your professional life. Uh, and again, that's res the things that are the circuitry responsible for that is that connection between the hypothalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, and cingulate cortex. Uh, so your question. 
that's what therapy is. Yeah. So think about how hard therapy can be, right? So it's going to take some time to literally rewire this very core part of your brain. But it can be done, and it can improve your life and your outcomes. To go get something like cognitive behavioral therapy that specifically is focused on changing your behavior and your acts. So focusing on, okay, if you're always on guard, let's find a way to be less on guard. If you're explosive, let's find a way to not be explosive. If you're hiding, let's find a way to not hide. Yes, it can be changed. It's very difficult to do so. But therapy absolutely does and can help. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Exactly, a new way to handle a situation. And if you're paying attention, even my first story about the donuts, it sounds all friendly, but if you're a person who feels bad, therefore gets donuts because of the circuit, that can be problematic as well. People end up with a lot of eating issues and dietary issues as they deal with stresses. Some people gain weight, some people lose weight, right? During stressful life events. And your coping mechanisms are going to have a lot to do with how well you can manage stressful situations without affecting your health. Yeah. With that having been said, I love donuts and I will always eat donuts. And I know better, but it, knowing better doesn't necessarily mean you do better. <laughs> you can try. That's about it. Okay, one more time. Hypothalamus is detecting your internal environment and sending that information via the fornix to the hippocampus, which retrieves the appropriate memories for that emotional state or physical state. Those memories will be associated with specific emotions, and you will feel those emotions, and that information gets sent along to the cingulate gyrus, which can execute that decision, which can execute a decision to fix your emotional state or change your emotional state. So again, this is a gyrus, this is gray matter, it has the power to actually do something like make you go get donuts or explode at your partner, whichever decision that may be, good or bad. Um, and again, it will affect memory formation. As you go through therapy and you find new ways to respond to stimuli, you'll develop new memories of things going better. And that's how you rewire yourself. So I do have this listed out for you now. This, again, is a newer slide, or at least a newer way of exploring this slide or this content. I do want to mention a lot of sources are going to refer to your amygdala as your fear center. I do consider it all of your emotions, personally. The reason we focus on fear is because research is done on rats, and it's a lot easier to tell if a rat is afraid compared to if that rat wants to stay in and watch Netflix all night, right? That's not really an emotion that we can quantify in a rat. Um, there are very few emotions we can quantify in rats. And we're starting to be able to quantify more. They like being tickled. We found that out. Um, yeah, <laughs> they have little giggles. We've, we've just recorded some rat giggles. We can probably look those up if anybody's interested. Yeah, absolutely. Amygdala, Inside Out characters. That's a great film. Yeah, from, from a neuroscience perspective, it's a great film. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 100% on board with it. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Questions about this content? We're doing pretty good. I know it's a lot of content really fast. It's going to keep being a lot of content really fast. That doesn't stop. All right. And we've been using this information all along, but we'll give it some names now. Your white matter, remember, is pathways. It's tracks, words we can use interchangeably because they all mean axons are here, going from one place to another. We have some specific patterns that we have some specific vocabulary for. An association tract is going to be, this axon is going from a neuron in this part of your cortex to another part of your cortex. The target of that tract is another part of your cortex. And it could be immediately right nearby. It could be primary motor cortex to association motor cortex. That would be an association tract. Between primary and association, it's very literal and straightforward. 
but it could also be from, let's say, cortex in your frontal lobe to cortex in your occipital lobe. If frontal needs to coordinate with occipital, then yeah, there's going to be an association tract between those two places. And there is. There are. So association tract you would define as a axon moving from gray matter to gray matter within the same hemisphere. It is not crossing the midline. Okay there. A commissural tract is specifically communicating between the right and left hemisphere. So you're going to have one structure where you're going to find most of your commissural tracts. What is that structure? Not the longitudinal fissure, that's that. You're in the right area logically. The big body, the corpus callosum, well done. Left to right hemisphere, those are commissural tracts. Most of your commissural tracts are coming through this corpus callosum. In fact, the only ones we're going to deal with are in the corpus callosum. So for your purposes, the only commissural tracts are in the corpus callosum. So they only communicate between right and left hemisphere, commissural tracts, corpus callosum. In fact, when we do our sheet brain dissection, you can actually take like a, a little probe and tease these fibers apart and you can see that they're three-dimensionally coming from towards you. And finally, projection tracts, by that we mean from brain to body or body to brain, projecting away from the brain. So that's going to be our sensory and motor pathways that we will cover. <coughs> Here's your textbook image to represent this. Here's a number of association fibers connecting gray matter to gray matter within the same hemisphere. Here's your commissural pathway, mostly through that corpus callosum. So it is possible to identify that corpus callosum in a coronal section like this one. So that's corpus callosum, and those are your commissural tracts. And then your projection tracts are sensory and motor pathways communicating between the brain and the body. Oh, I love how logically I laid this out. I'm really excited about it. Are you guys ready for some sensory and motor pathways? Not that you have a choice, no. Okay, um, now we've talked about afferent and efferent before. Afferent arriving to the CNS, efferent exiting the CNS, right? Sometimes we neuroscientists get a little lazy and we start referring to them as ascending and descending pathways. It's actually less than ideal uh, because some pathways like do a little loop in the send before the descend or the other way around. Um, but for our purposes, an ascending pathway is an afferent pathway. That's going to be a sensory pathway. If it comes from the body and goes to the brain, it is sensory. If it goes from the brain to the body, it is motor. And we'll, we would call that a descending pathway. Most of our pathways decusate. That means they cross from right to left or left to right. We are bilaterally symmetrical, so we will have pathways on both sides, all, well, both of them decusating to the opposite side, always. So far so good? Somebody define decusate. Crossing the midline, good. So we will have all of our sensory and motor pathways connecting to the opposite side of the brain from the body. So all of the ones that we're going to deal with, again, they're going to be contralateral. The right side, the right hemisphere is going to control the left body. The left hemisphere is going to control the right body. There are some ipsilateral pathways that do not decusate. I'm not going to teach any of them specifically. We've already covered the homunculus. There's another phrase for the mapping of the brain to the body. The homunculus is related to it. It's called somatotopy. 
It means that for a point on the brain, there's a corresponding part of the body, and you can map the neurons all the way from the brain to the body, the body to the brain. It's an unbroken pathway, right? So when I say, here's my hand, and here's where my hand is on my brain, I'm not lying. There's a nerve or a series of nerves going specifically right here. Point-to-point -point correspondence. And again, that's why we have a lot more territory for the face than the trunk, because we have more neurons from the face or to the face than we have neurons going to the trunk as a whole. There's actually a, an experiment that we did not do in this class last week because we were running out of time. It's called two-point discrimination test. And if we have time today, I'd like to do the two-point discrimination test. And that's where you take two toothpicks and you start by poking somebody somewhere sensitive like their finger. You put two of those toothpicks in the exact same spot to start. They're not looking at it, by the way. And then you pick them both up and you move one of them just like a millimeter over and you put it back down. And every time you put it down, can you feel one point or two points? And at a certain point on their finger, very quickly, they're going to say, there's two different points. I can feel two different points. Even without that visual information, they can feel that there's two points very, very quickly. When you move on to a less sensitive area, like the trunk that has less real estate in the brain, that area is going to be quite wide before they can feel two different points, two distinct points. So we should test that out later today and see how far apart people's two-point discrimination is on their trunk and prove to ourselves that you have very few nerve endings coming from your trunk and live very little real estate on your brain. And it is varying by person to person, but not significantly. Okay, so again, that's somatotopy. We're going to cover two sensory pathways and one motor pathway. And once again, you're going to get mad at me because your textbook is going to refer to it this way, and I'm going to refer to it this way. There's going to be multiple names for both of these because, honestly, I had to do these about 500 million times with my terminology, and it is permanently ingrained in my head with the terminology I learned. Uh, that's what happens when you do something five million times. It gets permanently ingrained that way. And then your textbook went and it tried to, to standardize the name into something that was very linguistic. Um, and it's just not the way I learned it, so I, I shoved my content back in there. Now, you might be thinking, why are there two different sensory pathways? There are multiple kinds of sensory information. Your body is largely going to group sensory information into fine touch, proprioception, light pressure and vibration. That's going to be one grouping. And then pain and temperature are going to be along another pathway. And yes, I phrased that slightly differently than your textbook did, again, because that's how I ingrained it into my brain. So in order to understand these two sensory pathways, I'm going to have to do some drawing. And you should probably draw with me. Now, these are, in my head, color-coded. And again, because I did these 500 million times to understand them, that color-coding is permanently ingrained in my head, and I can't do it any other way. So I'm going to require purple. And blue is our other sensory pathway. Let's we'll start with here. So I'm going to draw, first of all, a piece of your brain in a coronal section. So this is gray matter that I'm drawing, and then white matter would be deep in here. And that's just your cerebrum and a coronal cross section. Now I'm going to draw your brain stem down here in a very simplistic way. 
There's your brain stem. There's your spinal cord continuous with your brain stem. And now I'm going to take a cross section of your spinal cord and blow it up. And look a little bit like that butterfly. Got your central canal right there. You got your dorsal roots, ventral roots. You want to leave a lot of space. So again, this is just a cross section of what's going on in here by blowing up so that we can draw a lot of things. Some of you may be recognizing this. Head back and stay with your work. Let's see if it's also somewhere. Somebody has it. Yeah, somebody has this uh, drawn on the back of theirs so that you can draw it over and over and over again. I highly recommend drawing this over and over and over again. Let's start with spinal thalamic. Sure, why not? So out here is, let's say, your hand. You can make it a foot if you don't want to try drawing a hand. That's the worst hand I've ever drawn. Oh, well. And let's say this is getting cut with a knife of some kind. And it's also a really sad knife for a tree. So you'll have a sensory nerve ending. I always draw it kind of spirally that it's a sensory nerve ending. And that's going to come in just like we learned last week through that spinal nerve, through that dorsal ramus or dorsal root. That cell body is located in the dorsal root ganglion, just like it was last week. So, so far, we should be on really familiar ground for a sensory pathway. Now uh, this is spinal thalamic, which your textbook refers to as the anterolateral pathway. Linguistically, both of those things make sense. Uh, from the spine to the thalamus, and then our pathway we're going to find is located anterior and lateral. So this is neuron number one. We call this the first order neuron. Neuron number one has its cell body in the dorsal root ganglion, the notorious DRG. Yeah, almost a laugh. That was enough. That was enough for me. This neuron is actually going to terminate in the dorsal gray horn and synapse onto your second order neuron in the dorsal gray horn. This neuron is actually going to decusate. Remember that anterior white commissure we covered last week in the spinal column, spinal cord. So your second order neuron actually decusates within the spinal cord, pretty much right where that spinal nerve came in. I am simplifying here, but this is at the level of the spinal nerve is where it decusates. Now, the axons for spinal thalamic are going to be located in this anterolateral portion of the spinal cord. I'm going to illustrate it a little bit differently than your textbook is. They're going to separate it into an anterior portion and a lateral portion, anterior lateral. And I'm going to make it just one long thing because that's what I was taught by a med school neuroscientist. And so that's how I roll with it. Now at this point, this is the same axon. This is the territory that it's traveling in. Now we've got to start thinking three-dimensionally, and this pathway is going to start going up towards your brain. So now I'm going to skip from here, and now I'm illustrating that same pathway here. Now we're in your spinal cord up to your brain stem. It's going to do some stuff in your brain stem that we're really not going to worry about. That's your thalamus. It's going to synapse in your thalamus. And now you've got your tertiary neuron. Or third order. So there are three neurons in this circuit. This was your first neuron. It came from your hand, 
cell body was in the dorsal nerve ganglion. Synapse immediately in the dorsal gray horn onto your second organ neuron, which decussated, traveled through the spinal cord in that anterolateral portion, still in your spinal cord through your brain stem into your brain, synapsed again in your thalamus, third order neuron cell body was located in the thalamus, and that third order neuron projected to your primary somatosensory cortex on your post central gyrus. And that's the place where your hand should be, more or less, right? Head, arm, leg. So so good? I lost the caption already. Questions? Do you want me to repeat this right now? Stabbed on your finger. Got a paper cut, whatever. No susceptors out in the periphery. Send that along an ascending pathway or an afferent pathway through the dorsal root. Cell body is located in the dorsal root ganglion. Synapse is in the dorsal gray horn. Synapse onto the second order neuron cell body, which immediately decusates in the anterior white commissure. That axon will continue to travel through the spinal cord in an ascending pattern. So we catch it over here, same thing, represented two-dimensionally now for in this area. So now we're ascending. We have one more synapse in the thalamus, and that is going to be our third order neuron, which will project immediately to the primary somatosensory cortex on the postcentral gyrus. So again, we talked about this last week. Think of it like learning a new subway system. Like what was the station called? Where was that station? Where's the train going to? And then what's its purpose? So again, spinal thalamic, the purpose here is pain, temperature. That's my personal annotation for temperature. And uh, let's see, deep touch vibration. Yeah, pain and temperature are the ones I care about, but deep touch is also in there. So like getting slapped with a brick. Getting slapped with a hot brick if you want to put them all into one. Spinal thalamic is the same as ALP, anterolateral pathway. That's why it's all in purple right now. Ready for the next pathway? Your brain. <laughs> okay, now you're getting tickled with a feather. So you'll have a sensory nerve ending out on the periphery. And so far it's gonna start really familiar. You go in through the spinal nerve, through that dorsal root. Once again, you have your sensory uh, cell body for the first order neuron in that dorsal root ganglion. That's going to come in, and instead of synapsing or decusating, it's going to go right here. So these have a couple of different names that give us our naming conventions. Some people will refer to them as dorsal columns. Here's why. If you look at the dorsal part of the spinal cord, they look like columns. Do you believe me about the columns? The dorsal columns. I'm going to call them dorsal columns. This is the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. Now, if you remember from last week's spinal cord anatomy, this region is also known as the posterior funiculus. Your textbook's going to call it, let me move over to that one. There we go. Posterior funiculus medial lemniscus. 
they mean exactly the same thing. This is the posterior funiculus. It's the white matter that's in the dorsal region of the spinal cord. They're also called the dorsal columns because that's how they look dorsally. So I'm going to first call a medial and meniscus pathway, which is taking light touch, vibration, and proprioception. What's proprioception? You have a sense of proprioception, all of you do, hopefully. Hmm? What's proprioception? Go ahead and guess. You're scared to guess. <laughs> okay, proprioception is your sense of where you are in space. It's based on the angles of the joints and the parts of the dorsal. So it's independent of visual input, it's independent of vestibular input, and your sense of where you are in space. You know what that means, right? Taking information from your muscles and joints to give you your positional sense. And that's why, you know, stand on one foot, touch your finger to your nose, you can do that with your eyes closed if you're not drunk. Okay, so all we've got so far is our first order neuron came in through that dorsal root, primary neuron cell body and the dorsal root ganglion. And instead of synapsing or decusating, it's going to go into this territory right here. And again, just like we had in this territory over here, it's now three dimensional and it's coming towards your brain. So we'll just pick this up in your spinal cord. This information is still traveling on the same side. The information is traveling on, this is from your left hand, it's traveling up the left side of your spinal cord for now. It decusates and synapses in the medulla oblongata. So your second order neuron cell body is up here in your medulla oblongata. Now that second order neuron is going to project again to the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus is a relay station. Almost all of your circuits are going to stop in the thalamus and relay there. So now it's going to sign out onto your third order neuron and again project to your primary somatosensory cord for that somatotopy, for that point-to-point -point connection. If you're thinking this is obscene, I learned this in undergrad as well. This was definitely an undergrad topic. Okay, we've got two options. I can try to fit motor in here and put it all in one, or I can erase all the sensory information and start a new one. Which one? Add it for now. How about I add it once and then I erase everything and everything and independently. Okay. Because you can split. Some people are like adamantly saying no, some people are adamantly saying yes. So I'm gonna go in the opposite direction. Um, now instead of this primary somatosensory cortex, this is the primary motor cortex. By the way, annotations primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. That's just notation for that. And that's official notation. That's not my personal notation. So when we are talking about a motor pathway, now this is an efferent. It's almost time for a break, but I'm just going to push through if that's okay with you guys, because we're on a roll. So this is an efferent. So we're actually going to start in the brain, and we're going to go to the body. So all these sensory pathways, we started in the body, we went up to the brain. Right? So to start our motor pathway, we'll start in the primary motor cortex. There's your first cell body. In the primary motor cortex, of course, it's gray matter because that's where the cell bodies are. You're actually going to like this one. This is the simplest one. The name of this is the corticospinal tract, CST. Here's your primary motor neuron, uh, your upper motor neuron for CST. The axon is very simply going to go through the white matter of your brain, through your spinal cord and your brain, or sorry, through your brain stem. It's going to decusate 
at the pyramids, the pyramids of the Medulla. That's its decusation site. And now it's traveling in the spinal cord. The place it's traveling in the spinal cord is predominantly known as the lateral funiculus. This is a lateral distribution for this pathway, which does have long-term meaning for you, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is the lateral we're talking about for motor pathways. So again, we just went from this anterior view to a cross-sectional view. So this information is traveling down that lateral funiculus. And then we get to the thing we're innervating. We get to the level of the thing we're innervating. This axon's still the first order neuron. We're still on the first order neuron here. That's going to emerge when it's time to innervate the thing and immediately synapse in the ventral gray horn of the spinal cord. So here is the second order neuron. Cell body, it's in the ventral gray horn of the spinal cord. Again, that does have clinical significance for you. And now we should be back on familiar territory because you know that ventral gray horn is for motor neurons. You've already done this with your reflex arcs, right? So here's your lower motor neuron, your second order neuron. And that goes out through the ventral root to the spinal nerve. And then it's going to innervate a target organ. And you've already seen this one before too. This is the neuromuscular junction, right? So it'll innervate a muscle or a gland. We won't, we won't worry too much about the glands, but that's what it's doing. So there's only two neurons in this circuit. So sometimes instead of calling them first order, second order, primary, secondary, we just refer to an upper motor neuron, which is always starting in the primary motor cortex and a lower motor neuron, which always starts in an anterior gray horn. There's just so many clinical correlates for all of these. It sounds like a lot of information, but it is a lot of information. And um, every single aspect that I'm showing you, I think, has something clinically Gray horn or ventral gray horn. Okay, I think I'll put you on break, and while we're on break, I'll erase all of this and we can redo it in different contexts and ways. Questions before I stop the recording? <laughs>